This week we are talking about the music of China. I recently got to go to China on the 2007 Pac Rim Studies trip. I was truly amazed to be in a country that had 1.3 billion people. To put this in perspective, the United States has 303 million. So China has about three times as many people as the United States does. As I traveled through China, I noticed the following things about their music. One, piracy is very popular. You can purchase illegal copies of almost any CD or DVD that you would want. And this does not seem to be regulated by law. Second, students at universities are able to study Chinese traditional music and Western classical music. Also, many people are very interested in Western music. I noticed in many of the restaurants that I heard Christmas music being played, and it was in the middle of September. I also heard Kenny G music everywhere. And four, there is a huge gap between the rich and the poor. Some people can afford music lessons, while many, many others cannot even afford to buy clothes. Now I'd like to read you some excerpts from an article in the London Evening Standard that came out in April 2007. The name of this article is, China's Musical Revolution, A Hunger for All Things Western Has Opened Up a Valuable New Market for Classical Music. But is the industry doing enough to nurture it? The London Symphony Orchestra is in China this week, aiming to build relationships and make a name for itself in a booming market. The Chinese have discovered a hunger for Western classical music. Millions of children are, playing, are paying for piano lessons. Millions more are playing the violin. Estimates vary but 40 to 50 million pupils is in the figure, which is equivalent to the entire population of England. Classical music is perceived by many Chinese as a mark of quality. Whatever the cause, all it takes is one child in a tower block to start piano lessons, and before he or she can play chopsticks, there's an upright piano on every floor of the building, and you can hear scales at bedtime. The pianos, too, are no longer matchstick quality. America's prime Baldwin brand recently bought and upgraded a factory that turns out 30,000 uprights pianos and 10,000 grand pianos every year. Steinway and Benchstein have set up joint ventures with Chinese makers. Every middle-class home, it seems, wants a piano in China. Playing standards are competitive, to say the least. A music lover in her 20s told me she studied violin in Shanghai for 10 years before realizing she was not good enough. Two music magazines cater to a growing interest and UK's gramophone produces a Beijing off-print. A sea of young faces fills the halls. My fans in the West are all between 60 and 70, exclaimed New York-trained opera tenor Fan Jingma. But here in China, everyone is 20 to 30 years old. Two pianists, Lang Lang and Yundi Li, Enjoy pop star status. The flamboyant Lang is playing ten concertos with visiting orchestras this season and has a best selling DG record of sentimental Chinese favorites in the shops. Yundi Li, winner of the Warsaw's Chopin competition, recorded the two Chopin concertos in Watford with the Philharmonia and Sir Andrew's, Andrew Davis both of whom will be looking to make more waves in the new Shang, uh, Shangri-La, the land of heavenly musical promise. But before anyone gets carried away with dreams of quick riches, 
The warning signs are written large on the Great Wall. Mention the Berlin Orchestra's visit with Sir Simon Rattle in 2005, and the response is scornful. You know that they charge for you know what they charge for tickets? A minimum of a thousand yuan. Now the yuan, eight yuan equals one American dollar. So that's roughly a hundred and twenty American dollars. And a maximum they charged for tickets was four thousand yuan, which is about five hundred American dollars. That's more than people have to pay in Japan. Why do they come here to exploit us? The LSO, whose tickets start at 20 yuan higher than in London, insists that prices are set by local government controlled promoter, and they have to and they have no nothing to say in the matter. So why don't they give open rehearsals? Demand music lovers. In a land where 800 million Chinese earn less than $1 a day, the discrepancy is extreme. A similar delusion has set in with the record companies, which charge Western prices for new CDs. Why should I pay 150 yuan for a CD when I get exactly the same recording at a pirate shop for 6 yuan, demands an earnest young writer. But surely you know that piracy is theft, I protest. Sure, comes the reply, but piracy is the label's fault. They should have set the prices at what the people can afford. Money, 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 they will soon be singing at the edge of Tiananmen Square and within sight of Mao's great hall of the people. China, you soon discover, is a country of infinite contradictions. The taste for classical music in the big cities is genuine and intense, but the enthusiasts and activists that I met were wary were wary of Western exploitation and the gifts of foreign governments, chiefly the French and the Russians. There is a grassroots musical revolution afoot, and the Chinese are cautiously inviting foreign aid and advice. Those artists and organizations who connect directly with the vast talent pool of China's new generation have an extraordinary chance to generate a musical future. Now, before I leave you this week, let me recommend an online site called Questia. And you can find this at www.questia.com. This is a great site for doing research papers. It's an online library, and you have to pay for it, but I think the the price of it uh, will offset the great uh, wealth of information that it has. It has many, many books, magazines, journals, and more, and it will create a bibliography for you and really help you in writing your term papers while here at OC. I really wish they had it when I was a student. So check out questia.com. I think you'll really be happy I told you about it. So I will talk to you again next week. Goodbye.